want to take a moment of uh, personal privilege to announce an event coming up on Thursday, September 21st in the chapel. Uh, it is in your bulletin. Uh, it'll be at 6 o'clock p.m. Uh, we are going to host a literary roundtable, the first uh, in a series of these uh, that will be on the third Thursday of the month. Uh, our first roundtable will be uh, focused on the books Mouse and Fun Home, which are two books that have been banned and folks are agitating for their removal from libraries. Uh, so it sh promises to be an interesting conversation. Um, and we have those books available um, on a first come, first serve basis uh, in the church uh, office. So if you would like to take one and read it, and uh, be informed before you come. Uh, we invite you to do that. Bring the book back, either check it back in so that somebody else can read it or bring it with you to the event. And then we're gonna give them away at the event. So there you go. Um, please rise as you're able and join me in the call to worship. Where two or three are gathered together God is in their midst. We gather to proclaim the promises, to retell the stories, to remember who we are as people of God. So let us worship God together. Please be seated. <coughs> Invite us now to lay aside all works of evil and put on the armor of goodness. Let us live honorably putting on the Lord Jesus Christ to whom we confess now. Beautiful Savior, you have made your law clear. Love love one another, owe one another nothing but love, do no wrong to a neighbor, 
But we have not mastered what it is to love. We have fallen short, causing harm to others through careless action and thoughtless lack of action. Forgive us. Teach us how to love more fully, more perfectly, as generously as you love, following your law and fulfilling your will. Please assure us that you love us still as we offer our silent prayers of confession. Hear this blessed assurance. Christ does not judge us harshly. In fact, Christ forgives all our sin and leads us into new and everlasting life. We will not take this forgiveness for granted, but we will let it transform the way that we live and love. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Would you bow for the prayer of illumination? Faithful God, how blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Sanctify us by your word and spirit so that we may glorify you in the company of the faithful. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Genesis, chapter 28, verses 10 through 19. You can find this on page 22 of your pew Bible. This is Jacob's dream at Bethel. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north, and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. <clears throat> know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. 
So Jacob rose early in the morning and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Lutz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. Thank you all so much. Isn't it great to see our full choir back together? I love having them all together. Um, as I invite all the children up this morning, I'll just remind you, in case you don't smell the wonderful smells coming from downstairs, that it is second Sunday lunch, so I hope that you all join us downstairs after worship today. I will also announce that today we begin our three groups of Sunday school classes, thanks to some great volunteers, so I appreciate that greatly. So everyone, y'all have a seat right there. So as we leave today, of course, all the littles are going to go, but we also have a class today for our middle school and high school students. So please make sure when we go out today that you join us for that. Good morning, guys. How's everybody doing? Good. I'm so glad. I'm so glad to see you all. You know, last week I tried to trick all of you all into cleaning windows and bathrooms and all those things, right? Because it was Labor Day weekend. You didn't fall for that, did you? No, you didn't fall for that. But I do want to talk about work because a lot of you did help with some work this week. Wesley, what did we do this week? 
on Wednesday night. Do you remember? You, well, you did feed the dog at your house. But do you remember what we did together here at church on Wednesday night, Nora? We did something for our community. We filled 60 fuel bags for students at Liberty Elementary School. And you all did such a good job. It was kind of like herding cats for a little bit. But we had 60 bags out with lots of items to fill for students to have food over the weekends. And so our big question for Faith Focus on Wednesday night was, what does God think about our work? What do you think he thought about that night? You think he thought that was good? Absolutely. I hope that you can come on Wednesday night this week because we have more big questions to talk about and more big things to talk about. Speaking of work, anybody do any work this weekend at home? Any chores, anything like that? Did you notice this fancy bracelet I have on? Yeah. Do you know what this is? What is it, Isabella? It's duct tape. Take a little piece of duct tape. Just one piece. Take a piece. Don't stick it on the pew, please. Don't need to be in trouble for that. Can y'all take a piece and pass it around? There are so many things that we can do with duct tape. Have you ever used duct tape at home? Oh, oh that's a good one. Joe put it over his mouth. <laughs> I didn't encourage him to do that, Charles. I promise. I'm going to encourage you not to put it on your mouth. What does it feel like? It's sticky. What else does it feel like? Wesley? You use duct tape to make a sword and a shield. There's so many uses for it. I think it's probably the handiest tool I have in my entire garage. There's so many things, but today, guess what we're going to do with duct tape? We're going to talk about how duct tape is like our faith. And we just heard a song called Blessed Assurance, and we're going to talk about what that means. How do you think duct tape is like our faith? Don't answer out loud, because you have to save all those great answers for Sunday school. But I want you to think about how we're going to use this duct tape today as we close our eyes and say a quick prayer. You ready? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing the work that we do for others. Please be with these children this week as they encounter sticky situations, as they balance school and all their activities, as they travel to and from school and all the places they go. Please wrap them tight with your love. Give them the strength as strong as duct tape and let them delight in the confidence of your blessed assurance. In your name we pray. Amen. Our second reading comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 7, starting at verse 9, and we're going to read through verse 17. This is the gathered multitude of every nation that John sees in heaven. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these robed in white and where have they come from? And I said to him, uh, Sir, you are the one that knows. And then he said to me, 
These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them, and they will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. So every year at about this time, I like to draw your attention to the beauty of the sanctuary that we worship in, um, and especially to the symbols that are all around us, which sometimes, because of their familiarity, just escape our attention and our notice. This Uh, began back in 1956 with a sermon by the Reverend William F. Summers. And so I've pulled his sermon up, and we have copies of it if anyone would like to see it. Um, And I would like to just walk through especially the symbols that are at the top of each of the stained glass windows and remind us of their symbolism. So first, in this window is the crown of thorns, Uh, The crown, of course, that was placed on Jesus' head at the crucifixion. And then in the second pane of the window, um, you get the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of the law, which are central to the Old Covenant and also to the New Covenant. Um, And that Jesus comes and fulfills these commandments for us and in us and through us. And then the next one... And I always get, these are out of order. The crown, the cross and crown, you can barely see the cross, or at least I can barely see it. It's darker than the crown, but it sits diagonally through the crown. Uh, Hebrews 12, 2, Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, and for the sake of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. So this is a glorious crown, not the crown of thorns, but it also still has the suffering of the cross lying through it. Uh, And then uh, the dove descending, and we have the dove, of course, in each of the banners as well around the uh, sanctuary. But this descending dove uh, is a reminder from John chapter 1, verse 32. John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. And then at the end here, Uh, You have the brazen serpent from John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, and earlier, of course, in the story of Moses. Um, And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then moving around to the other side, uh, we have the cluster of grapes from Luke chapter 22, verses 17 and 18. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So it is a symbol of the kingdom of God and of new life in Christ, which we receive at communion. Next, we have an anchor, uh, and from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, we have this hope. A sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered. So Jesus becomes the anchor of our soul and the source of that blessed assurance that we're going to talk about here in just a minute. And then the grain, the wheat, and the tares from Matthew chapter 13, verse 30. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And I will tell the reapers, gather the wheat into my, uh, into my barns. And so uh, that wheat represents uh, that uh, gathering of people that Jesus does. Then the open Bible, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, you have been born anew, not of perishable, but of the imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. And so notice how the open Bible And the Ten Commandments are facing one another, that uh, reference to the Word. 
Um, and then the scales, the last of the images here from Daniel chapter 5, verse 27, where Daniel says, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting, indicating uh, the importance of God's justice uh, in uh, our lives. So the symbols, and there are a lot more, carved into the pews, carved onto the front of the uh, communion table. Uh, there are the interlocking symbols of the circles, which you'll see in various places, uh, representing the Trinity, the three circles together. So our sanctuary is full of these symbols. You can't see them very well, but you even have the heads of the apostles on, the, uh, on these chandeliers. If you go out into the vestibule, there's one that's like at eye level that you can actually see what they look, at, uh, look like. So I encourage you, not during the, yes, during the sermon, to look around, <laughs> see the symbols, reflect on what they mean for our faith, um, and we will come back to this again and again and refresh our memory uh, at least once a year of what an incredible gift we've been given in this sanctuary. And now, for the next Six weeks or so, we will focus on some of the most well-known and beloved of the 19th century hymns. The title of this series is Give Me That Old Time Religion, um, the hymns of the 1800s. And today, the focus, very appropriately, I think, falls on a gospel song by Francis Jane Crosby, better known as Fanny J. Crosby, which was copyrighted and published in 1873 just three years before the cornerstone was laid for this sanctuary in which we worship. So almost contemporaneous with the building of this place is the writing of this song. Now, Fanny Crosby grew up Presbyterian, Northern Presbyterian, New School Presbyterian, uh, Abolitionist Presbyterian, right? All of those things that the Southern Church was not. Uh, and her cousin, Howard Crosby, was the pastor of Fourth Presbyterian in New York City but you all will know her better because of her claim to fame in the 20th century as a relative of the crooners Bing and Bob. Let you take a minute to let that sink in. All right, take your hymnal. Let's open to this hymn, page 839. We'll take just a minute to look at it. Um, it is uh, the hymn tune, which is at the bottom of that first page of the hymn, is Assurance. It was actually written for, uh, in, in fact, the words were written for this particular tune, and it's uh, not used with much else that I'm aware of, maybe not anything else. But um, at any rate, Assurance is the hymn tune. And notice the... Um, uh, there at the uh, bottom of that, you have a 9.10.9.9, and that's just the number of measures in each of the lines of the song, and then it says, with refrain. This is a very regular hymn, uh, so let's just, we're going to just sort of, yeah, excuse me, this is the English major in me. We're going to just walk through the first line of the hymn. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Notice where the stress falls on those words. Um, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Notice where the long and the short stresses are. It's a little easier in the next line. O what a foretaste of glory divine. It's long, short, short, long, short, short, long, short. Got it? It's trochaic, not iambic. In other words, it's not da dum da dum da dum da dum It's da dum da dum With me so far? Look at the rhyme pattern at, uh, that's here. So, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. 
Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, mine divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Okay, well, that's a near rhyme, right? It's not exact, but it, it'll do. Um, and uh, then again, perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight, delight in sight, angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. Ah, we managed to get the rhyme going in that one. Okay, enough of that. You'll note that only two of Ms. Crosby's 8,000 hymns and 8,500 plus hymn texts are actually in our hymnal. The other one is To God Be the Glory, and I'll get back to it in just a minute. By contrast, in the Pentecostal church where I grew up, more than half of our hymnal, which was considerably less big than a Presbyterian hymnal, were Fanny J. Crosby songs. And this is true of many Pentecostal churches, Church of God, Methodist, Wesleyan, Nazarene, and the like. So if you grew up in one of those traditions, you probably know a lot of her songs and can even sing them. Uh, songs like, All the Way My Shepherd Leads Me, or I Am Thine, O Lord. You may know it better as, Draw Me Nearer, 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 Blessed. Okay. Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Praise him, praise him, Jesus. Um, you, you know these songs? Some of you, uh, some of you know them, don't you? Uh, redeemed how I love to proclaim it and safe in the arms of Jesus. The holiness connection, that is what would become Pentecostal Assembly of God, Church of God, uh, churches, um, is important. Blessed Assurance actually first appeared in the July 1873 issue of Palmer's Guide to Holiness and Revival, miscellany. A magazine printed by Dr. and Mrs. W.C. Palmer. Now their daughter, Phoebe Palmer Knapp, if you have the hymnal still open, she's actually the tune writer. So these important revivalists and holiness folks in the holiness movement of the time uh, and their daughter became very good friends with Fanny Crosby. Um, and the holiness movement, it was a renewal movement from the 1830s to the, about the 1890s and beyond. At first, it happens within Protestant denominations, particularly the Methodist church. And then these groups began breaking out and forming their own associations. Their goal, as the name implies, was to promote holiness and personal piety in the Christian life. And they did this all kinds of ways, through camp meetings, uh, which Crosby attended with the Palmers, through revivals, through Sunday school. There was singing, a lot of singing in Sunday school at the time, and midweek prayer meetings and Bible studies and the like. Their periodicals, like this magazine, were full of poetry and hagiographic biography, testimony, spiritual autobiography, and of course, Fanny J. Crosby's hymns, which fairly gush with a kindred spirit of earnest piety. A significant percentage of the lyricists for these holiness hymns were women. And by the time you get to the end of this movement, some 50 to 56 percent of all the new compositions by the end of the period were by women. Now what the holiness folks were searching for was intimacy and connection. They were looking for a secure union with God in Christ Jesus. Think about the hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine, right? Uh, it, it is this secure relationship and union with God in Christ. And then the second thing was, of course, a stable and integrated identity. That is, they turn their focus internally and look at themselves, and they're seeking a solution to the fickleness of the human heart. This unsure and divided heart. They want an undivided soul that could be united, <laughs> come together. Uh, and revealed uh, as uh, the romantic self, right? This, this is the notion of a deeply personal individual, uh, and so the hymns are full of these references to I and me and mine. 
And then thirdly, intimacy in the Christian community. Now, some of you probably won't be too comfortable with this. Presbyterians sometimes aren't, but, you know, they want to love one another. Love one another. Feel the love for one another, right? Not just, not just sort of have it inside deep somewhere. So they wanted to feel this connection with God, intimate. They wanted to feel that their heart was aligned right? That there wasn't any division. And they wanted to feel this love for one another. The key is a kind of heart knowledge, finding and expressing the appropriate emotions in every one of these areas of life with God, internally, the community, rather than an appeal to head knowledge. So Crosby's hymns focus on this union and intimacy, especially with Jesus. Because, of course, we can relate to Jesus. Right? So, I in my Savior, that's a piece of this hymn. I in my Savior, that's intimate, that's close. Whispers of love. Lost in his love. An assurance of Jesus' presence right now. Jesus is mine. And a strong emotion. Notice how each of those first lines start with an exclamation point. Every time you come to the next line, right at the beginning, there's this strong exclamation. And notice the language of emotion. There's glory. And there's delight. And there's rapture. And my heart bursts. Right? That's what's here. I'm happy and I'm blessed. These are combined then with salvation through the blood of Jesus. And friends, in these hymns, there is always blood, lots and lots of blood. And eternal life, right? Watching and waiting, looking above. But she stays away, Crosby does, from the cerebral church doctrines. You're not going to find the word incarnation, trinity, baptism, communion. Right? Presbyterians tend to emphasize the opposite. Right? We're not so big on emotion. And we really want to emphasize God's sovereignty, God's transcendence, God's providence, God's divine election, and doing things decently and in order, which, you know, when you get really too emotional, you can't do that. So, so that's what Presbyterians have always held on to, which means that we're less than comfortable with the highly emotional. Now, in literary terms, in historical terms, Fanny Crosby is a romantic poet. She digs deep into that tradition. She renounces rationalism and order, right, the Enlightenment era, and stresses the importance of ardor, of burning with fervent desire, the expressing of authentic personal feelings, individualism, idealism, emotional passion, and an interest in the mystical and the supernatural. So, it doesn't come as any surprise that she's a near contemporary of Emily Dickinson, Walt Whitman, Melville, Longfellow, Poe. She's an heir along with them of the earlier English romantics, William Blake, William Wordsworth, Anne Dorothy, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, uh, Lord Byron, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Anne Mary Shelley, and John Keats, and Mary Alcock, and Mary Robinson, and Felicia Hemans, and Anne Radcliffe, and on and on it goes. Now, human fashion including our likes and dislikes of particular kinds of music and poetry. They vary, they ebb and flow. Sometimes we're more realistic, sometimes we're more idealistic. Sometimes uh, we have a sense of um, the personal and the intimate. Sometimes it's more the transcendent. Romanticism has always had its detractors and can be taken to an extreme. And when it is, it it's becomes a kind of irrational egotism where things are not really real unless I feel them, right? If I can feel them. And that becomes a kind of idolizing of the human interior. The human mind and heart becomes the measure by which we measure everything, in which I and me and my and mine become all that matter, the only thing that is left, 
then is a kind of religious sensibility without a religious belief, a doctrine. The sort of thing one sometimes hear people say when they say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. As I said, these things ebb and flow, right? At times, we need and want the more intimate and personal, and at times, we need and want the more transcendent. And the Christian faith brings all of these together without excluding any of them. And though Crosby's New School abolitionist Presbyterian hymns and her emotional holiness songs were probably rejected in 1878 when we started worshiping uh, in this building by the old school southern formerly slave-holding Presbyterians at FPC Clarksville, but eventually the tide would change. Eventually uh, the tide changes, and so I brought with me a couple of hymnals. It will not surprise you that I have the 1955 hymnal, the 1990 hymnal, and of course our current hymnal, which is sitting there. In the 1955, by 1955, we had at least five of Fanny Crosby's hymns in our hymnal. Blessed Assurance was there. Jesus is tenderly calling thee home. Wonderful funeral hymn there. I am thine, O Lord. You all know that one. I know you've sung that one. All the way my Savior leads me, and Jesus keep me near the cross. 1955. By that time, churches everywhere had included these revival Sunday school songs in their Sabbath day stayed worship. 1990. You will look and look and look. And there is no Fanny J. Crosby. <laughs> From 1950 to 1990, the pendulum had swung all the way. And then, of course, as we've said, in today's hymnal, in our hymnal this morning, there are two. And the reason, again, that we have to God be the glory in our hymnal is that it's one of these transcendent, it doesn't mention I, me, my, mine, any of that personal, emotional, you know, it's, it's all... Glory to God. So that's where we are. The other thing that I want you to note about this particular hymn uh, in looking at it in the hymnal is that the Korean version is there. The text of the Korean hymn is there. The reason that this hymn, which goes against so much of how we think and how we worship, etc., the reason it's here is because of an incredible connection with Korean Presbyterian missions. A lot of missions was done when colonial powers went in and they forced Christianity on uh, a group that they had conquered. But that's not the case here. Korean became Presbyterian at a time of conflict between the Chinese and the Japanese. And a few Christians who were also doctors were able to come into Korea. Uh, before this, again, you have the history of the Roman Catholic Church, and I, I won't go there. I'm just talking about Protestant Christianity. By the 19, late 1800s, early 1900s, doctors were showing up who were also Christian and who had come there to share their faith in the midst of this conflict uh, between China and Japan. And they received an incredible reception. In fact, today, there are more Presbyterians in Korea than there are in the United States. And it's their insistence on these hymn committees, etc., that said, no, we love this hymn. We want this hymn in this hymnal. That means it is here and preserved for us, and we are able to sing it. It was a different way of doing mission. It really did. Uh, it was the first time in Presbyterian missions especially where basically as the church was formed, all of the governance of the church was handed over to Koreans uh, and they from the very beginning have 
been the ones who were the leaders. The, they established their own seminaries. Uh, they raised up pastors and created this church without us building buildings or doing any of those sorts of things. The Romantics, including Crosby, did one more thing that is really important, I think, to our faith. And that is they insist on giving a voice to those who tend to be marginalized and oppressed by society. To the rural poor, to the discharged soldiers from the Civil War, to the fallen of various sorts, and they mean morally fallen, the insane, but especially to children. They had a different way of looking at children and one which we have all come to appreciate. And that is, they didn't treat them like Presbyterians did as just little versions of the reprobates that we all are. They looked at them and saw innocence that could be educated and trained and brought up in a way that would help them to know God, and especially to know God in this personal, assured way. It's the potential there in those children that is the beginning point of some of these hymns and their use in Sunday schools. And the conclusion of the hymns for Crosby almost always looks to heaven. So if you look at that third verse, you'll see that watching and waiting, looking to heaven. And it's that potential for heaven that this blind hymn writer projects onto heaven. It's like she invites us, use your imagination. I know you can't see it. And for her, she was literally blind. Use your fancy, use your internal emotional connection to imagine what real union with God will be like when it's fully realized. And so I invite you when we sing the hymn at the end of our worship to do that, to allow yourself to feel and to enter in to what Crosby felt. And to allow yourself to connect emotionally to God. <laughs> to allow your heart to be aligned with that worship of God as a self. <laughs> and with one another. So I expect when we sing it, to really sing it. And emphasize those exclamation points. Amen.
Please join me in our affirmation of faith, please. The life, death, resurrection, and promised coming of Jesus Christ has set the pattern for the church's mission. His human life involves the church in the common life of all people. His service to men and women commits the church to work for every form of human well-being. His suffering makes the church sensitive to all human suffering so that it sees the face of Christ in the faces of persons in every kind of need. His crucifixion discloses to the church God's judgment on the inhumanity that marks human relations and the awful consequences of the church's own complicity in injustice. In the power of the risen Christ and the hope of his coming, the church sees the promise of God's renewal of human life in society and of God's victory over all wrong. The church follows this pattern in the form of its life and in the method of its action. So to live and serve is to confess Christ as Lord. Please be seated. So again, looking deeply inside let us be one mind and one heart in the spirit as we pray. Let us pray. God, we pray for the church that you would make us a temple of forgiveness, a sanctuary for all who are in trouble, and that you would indeed be near to us when we gather in Christ's name. We pray for the earth. We pray that you would act with love and mercy and compassion to bring to an end the bitter plagues that destroy us and wash away the stain of pollution we pray for the nations. We pray especially this morning for the people of Morocco and of Marrakesh as they face the devastation of the earthquake and loss of life. Bring aid and comfort and hope, we pray. Send those who will bind up the wounds and heal the hearts that mourn. We pray for our own community. On yet another anniversary of 9-11, We remember that awful morning and we pray for those who continue to suffer from the effects of that day. We pray that you would show us how to love one another, how to live in peace, how to keep our neighborhoods and our streets free of violence, how to protect our families and our homes from harm. Help us to be moved with your compassion as we pray for our loved ones. For Amy Lee, Anita Randolph, for Nell Gracie, for Bessie Costanza, for David Morgan. for Don Atkins, for Ella Hay, for Herschel, <clears throat> for Herschel Basham Sr., and for Joan Jenkins, for Kim Smith, and Lou Metz, for Liz Goder Wallace, for Lori Graves Hirsch, for Melanie Cobb, 
for Nancy Sneed, for Raina and Joey Williamson, for Sean Joy. By your saving and healing and liberating grace, help those who are weak and suffering and give life to those who turn to you in need. And help us to live lives that are worthy of the gospel. To the glory of the name that is above all names, Jesus Christ our Lord. And now teach us again to pray the way that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So I know your hearts are bursting with happiness and joy and emotion. Pour that into your giving this morning. Your gifts will now be received.
Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks for that blessed assurance that Jesus is indeed the anchor of our souls. We thank you for abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness to us, and so we offer with gratitude the gifts that we have brought and pray that you would bless them. And together, may we share your mercy and your grace with the world that you so clearly love. In Jesus' name, amen. So I said we'd come back to the blood, right? Lots and lots of blood. So there is only one doctrine of the church that Crosby will return to over and over and over again, and it's the doctrine of atonement. Now, she will not use that word, but it's in Jesus that all of this security happens. It is in Jesus and the blood of Jesus as a sacrificial lamb, as a purchase for our sins, as all of these things. These are all doctrines of atonement. You may not know them that way. What does that mean? She is so interested in us being at one, right? At one month. This notion of we can feel that assurance that we are at one with God at one in ourselves, and at one with one another. So go out into the world to share that blessed assurance. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with you today and always. Amen.